Buonasera a tutti, eh, sono Forad Latif, un, un ingegnere del software indipendente e oggi vi parlerò di mh, domain driven design e come anche quelli responsibility segregation. Prima volevo iniziare, mh, qualcuno ha un problema con l'inglese o se, se qualcuno non capisce l'inglese alzi la mano? Non capisce. <ride> Ok, no perché negli ultimi anni il code motion sta diventando sempre più internazionale, quindi c'è gente da fuori e volevo essere sicuro che mi capiscano tutti. Uh, is there anyone here that doesn't understand Italian? <laughs> One guy. <laughs> ok. Uh, se per voi non è un problema lo farei in inglese, però se qualcuno non... Eh? Ah, no, no, sì. um, ok vado avanti poi se, se non capite qualcosa fermatemi domande in italiano in inglese non è un problema ok esatto ok uh, well let's get started then um, we've just been commissioned uh, a new greenfield project um, that means we need to um, get our requirements usually, then we model our entities, and then we scaffold our project based on those entities. That's what we usually do. We just follow these three steps, and for every pr new project that uh, comes up, I'll, I'll, at, at least that's what I've seen, I mean, it's like a religion, you just... Uh, <laughs> follow these three steps, you may iterate, you may do some agile, but I'm going to focus on those three steps for now. So, um, the architecture usually looks like this. It's, uh, it's pretty simple. It's a uh, layered architecture, the so-called layer architecture. It's a presentation layer, uh, the business layer with the business logic and our entities, and then the, the persistence layer in which we persist the entities to the database. Um, this architecture was used like for <laughs> decades up until lately when uh, we started to find lots of problems in complex domains. And um, so we're gonna see now uh, how the classic approach, that one, a uh, uh, so-called CRUD approach, because we only uh, allow uh, create, read, update, and delete operations in our domain, but our domain is much more complex than that, and we're gonna see why that's a problem. And uh, second is that mm, there's a lot to, to talk about now, so, uh, you're gonna leave this room with more questions than answers, and that's a good thing, because uh, you're gonna, hopefully, I'm gonna convince you to change your mindset a little bit. Not always, there is no silver bullet. You may use this architecture to do something fast and quick, but uh, uh, it's not uh, the best solution for complex projects, especially if your business depends on them. So, let's say that our Greenfield project uh, has, it's a simple e-commerce site, so we have a product entity, a customer entity, an order, and an address for the customer. A line item, that's uh, is part of the order, it's pretty simple. So we're, we're gonna stick with simple uh, domain rules so that the concepts uh, will be more clear. In fact, I want you to focus on the concepts and on the abstractions, not so much on the technical details or uh, on the business rules that may not be correct, as I'm not that experienced with e-commerce sites. So, uh, what, do you, what do we mean by entity, by the way? Um, an entity, uh, in the classic approach, at least as I, um, the way I've seen it in most projects, is just a uh, class with fields and getters and setters, and that's about it. That's an entity. And that entity represents a table in a relational database, usually. That's another thing that I want you to change your mind about. Uh, when we start a new project, we usually throw relational at the problem by religion, almost. So we usually use this thing to scaffold services, controllers, and create the schemas in the database. Uh, 
without ask I mean that's not really uh, not even encapsulation and we're gonna see why later so if if objects do not contain uh, business logic where, where is the business logic we usually put the business logic in services like this here's a discount product example so you get the product you uh, this part this these lines here they're um, they are uh, the business logic of the product object but they're they're leaked they're in the service now um, and in in the worst cases I've seen you you have this that is you you get in the controller you somehow get the the product already filled in and magically you you just get the uh, the the product uh, synchronized with your mapper and all you have to do is save in fact in some cases you could even save your yourself a little uh, trouble and add save to the magic so it, it's magical it just saves the project the product uh, it, it just saves an interface to the product directly to the database but what you've done here is you've just deployed the application to the user's brain because if you want to discount let's get back go back to the first slide the, this b simple business rule if the discount is more than 30 percent we'll classify that as a super discount for maybe we can show that in a in the main page the the, the products with super discount or something like that or, or maybe you can we can decide something based on it but that's that's irrelevant now the, the business rule is that more than 30 percent is classified like that here the user has to remember that if he puts more than 30 percent in the discount form he needs to classify that as a super discount so you basically your user becomes part of the system and what what's the added value of that your user remembers the business rules if they change in fact i've, I've heard some people say this way is the best because if the business rules change all you have to do is write a new manual so the users will have to learn new rules and and you don't have to deploy a single line of code, but that I don't see much added value uh, the <laughs> uh, other than, in fact, it's like a spre uh, Excel spreadsheet in that case. So uh, are we doing object-oriented programming? In fact, in my opinion, we're not doing object-oriented programming. In fact, it's not, I don't think you could call that even an opinion because object-oriented programming is basically by definition state encapsulated protected and behavior that modifies that state in a single abstraction called an object uh, and look at the uh, at the object at, at the left side of the at the right side of the screen you don't have behavior you are supposedly encapsulating your state but you're not encapsulating your state because you're still showing the world the, the internal properties that the, this object contains so <laughs> in fact that those getters and setters are completely useless they're just wrappers to a property and everyone knows that a property exists so it loosely uh, your objects are not loosely coupled they're highly coupled because if you change the state of your object your getters are going to change your servers are going to change and uh, all the uh, parts of your system that use that object are not going to be able to you're gonna have to reprogram them and uh, business rules are leaked all over the place in fact uh, and they are implicit in some cases this uh, to go back to the previous example if you have uh, a discount more than 30 percent you set the status then if you uh, in another service you discount the product for some reason another reason than the manual discount in inputted by by the user uh, and then you set the discount, but you forget to uh, to classify the, the, the product as a, a super discount. So you have you either have to copy that, or another service has to include product service and call discount on it. So you're going to have to do, to have a, a layered with n layers of services, remembering where the business logic is, and uh, uh, or you're gonna you risk doing this. In fact, if you put the logic in the, in the object, it, you solve all your problems because all, all the invariants that, are, um, uh, that regard the state of that object 
are in the object itself. You don't have to worry about it. any service or any any other piece of code calling this object because it, its its property is going to be maintained. Its, its invariants are going to be maintained. Now, this is not domain-driven design. This is object-oriented programming. It's the basics. But I'm, I'm repeating this because it's a prerequisite. And most projects I've seen, and a lot of frameworks encourage the other approach, which I'm not saying it's wrong. It's faster, probably, because of the uh, scaffolding that you get. But when you, your object, is, or your domain starts getting more complicated, it's, it, it becomes a problem. And we're going to see some examples of that. Now, uh, back to our entities. Um, we have uh, entities, up to now, they meant tables in a relational database. But uh, in domain-driven design, you actually think about them a little bit more conceptually. In fact, the database is not important. We should ignore the database when thinking about entities or thinking about concepts. So the customer is a concept that has an address. Address may have a table in the relational database where you shouldn't care about it. Address, in fact, is not a, an entity as far as domain-driven design is concerned because address is a value that we don't care. It represents, um, we don't care about its changes. It represents uh, what a concept was at a certain point in time. Whereas customer, if you change, uh, I don't know, your telephone, we may want to uh, send you an SMS, uh, I mean, the customer has an identity that is not based on the properties it has. Whereas the address, we, all we care about is, is, is the, the information inside the object, not the entity of that specific, not the identity of that specific address. In fact, in, according to domain driven design, we have um, the entities that are, um, are unique based on identity, on a conceptual identity. Whereas value objects are just values. And don't confuse value object with the value object pattern that means uh, messaging uh, across distributed systems. It's value objects means a value. That's it. Address is a value. If it was a string, it wouldn't be different for us, right? However, if a customer was a string, it would be a problem because we, we, <laughs> we cannot uh, track changes to the customer. We cannot call behaviors on the customer. Address is just a string for us, it's not a problem. So that's a value object, even if it has a relational table in the database. So entities in domain-driven design are more conceptual. They're not the same entities that we, we, we used to work with before. Now, um, what a purchase looks like. Now imagine the user has um, selected a couple of items. Um, then he wants to purchase the, those items. You're going to have an order object that uh, is going to be already co already compiled, so we, we, we won't show that part. So you just get the order object. You call purchase on the order object. After the, the, the order was purchased, you may want to update your product catalog to uh, set the availability of that product, to reduce the number of products available of that type. Like if you bought, you bought a book, there were nine books, now there are eight books. It's just a basic, uh, simple example. And then after the purchase was done, you may want to uh, send an email to your customer to verify the purchase. Ah, OK. Now? Others? Ah, OK. Perfecto. Others? Ah, sí. No. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, so uh, this is a basic example. So um, what, um, what's wrong with that? Can anyone spot a problem here? It's wrapped in a transaction, and uh, we're going to just call an email service and a product service. OK. <laughs> yeah, except my, my friends. <laughs> what if we, our email system goes down? Uh, order, no, no. <laughs> What's the problem with order ID? No, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, if, if there's a typo, I, I didn't mean a typo. Uh, I meant a, a conceptual, a, a, a very big problem. In fact, if our email system goes down, that thing is going to do a rollback. I mean, we're going to be, our system is going to be useless because the email service is inside the transaction. 
So you send an email to verify the purchase, it, go, it, it throws an exception, and then your, your purchase is, gonna, is not going to happen. So your, your entire system and e-commerce site is going to be blocked for such a trivial problem. Now imagine if you, if you tell your boss, I mean, we lost just, I don't know, $10,000 in the last minutes because the email system was down. I don't think he's going to be very happy about that. So um, the problem is that we're mixing, we're mixing uh, uh, concerns here. I mean, the, the concern of the order uh, service is to just purchase an order. What happens later is not actually, uh, as far as the order service is concerned, it's already done what, what it has to do. The email is another thing that will happen later as an effect, uh, as, a, uh, as a byproduct of, of, of the order being purchased. In fact, uh, this is a concept called domain events. Uh, that are formalized a little bit more with a, more, a little bit more detail in domain-driven design. Domain events mean events that happen in the domain that our business care about, that our users care about, but usually um, they're, they're rendered explicitly because it doesn't mean they didn't happen. Here, a purchase did happen, but we just didn't model it explicitly. Now, if we model domain events explicitly, uh, we can have uh, we can use the observer pattern, right? You ha you have uh, listeners like this, and they listen to some event that happens, and they do something as a consequence of that event happening. In fact, you can have hierarchies of events. Like you can throw an event like something uh, system error, and system error can have various subclasses of systems. And with a single handler, you just do something whenever a system error happened. But that's uh, that's just beside the point. The the, the important thing is to um, remember that domain events are a, a central concept to our domain. In fact, we shouldn't ignore them. In fact, if we refactor our um, email problem like this, you have an order service. You do a purchase, then you call the product service, and then you use an event bus to push, to push the event. If you push the event, then in the event bus, eventually, this handler is going to be called, and the handler is going to send an email, but in another transaction. In fact, maybe later, maybe an hour later. Who cares? In fact, that way, if our email system go goes down, um, no problem. I mean, the only side effect is that our users won't get an email, but we won't, get, we won't be down or we won't lose uh, thousands of dollars because of that. Uh, so. Uh, and you can do even a, you can wrap these handlers in retrying transactions, right? If something goes wrong, you can retry it later. You can retry it later, and if if it keeps going wrong, you you send an email to yourself or your sysadmins, and they fix the problem. But you you decouple yourself from those uh, non-important concerns, and they they don't they don't even have uh, an importance uh, when when it comes to your concepts. It's just a side effect. Now uh, there's another problem here, however. Um, we are uh, we are calling the product service. The product service um, deals with another object, which is the product object. That product object represents a product in our catalog. So imagine Amazon, right? If you have a book, for example. You would have the book, uh, the author, and how many items are available. So if you if a user purchases one of those books the product catalog is going to be updated with the number of items available, right? They, they're going to be reduced. Or if you get new books, you're going to uh, increment the number of books available. So that we are using in the same transaction two different objects. And uh, what happens if uh, there is a super popular product that's just selling like pancakes? Uh, again, you're going to because an order may be unique, but the product in the product catalog is not. So if one user purchases a book, the, the super hot product, the same other user purchases the same product in the same amount of time, it's, it's not likely in this example, but it happens. And uh, uh, it's going to crash. It's going to crash because we're dealing with two different concepts, two different objects in the same transaction. The solution is, again, domain events. 
in fact, this is the right way to do um, uh, operations with the concurrent domains, especially. Uh, you just do something trivial, update an order. Well, it's not that trivial, but anyway, it's just a single operation with a single concern. And then you push your event to the domain bus, to the event bus, sorry. Then there is a, there's a pattern called process manager, but don't worry about it. There are many ways of wiring events to, 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 uh, to, to be part of a process. And this is going to listen to the events, and then they're going to call the progress service. So now you've decoupled your, um, your product service and your uh, order service and your email system. So now the probability that you will go down as a result of it is uh, it's not that high. Plus, when the user experts, uh, domain experts speak to you, they don't speak to you in, uh, in, um, in a procedural language usually. Sometimes they do, but what, in fact, if you, take, if you pay attention to the email example, after a user has purchased an item, send an email. After has purchased an item a past, uh, in the past tense, so after it happened. And in, the, in our system, something didn't happen if it wasn't committed to the database. So after the commit, send an email because it happened. And it matches perfectly with the uh, domain events and event handlers. So um, this... Uh, this leads to a, another concept called the aggregate routes. Do not pay, <laughs> if you don't understand something, don't worry because there, there are many difficult concepts and uh, all I want you to do in this talk is to understand why are, there are many problems with traditional approaches and what solutions can we uh, provide using methodologies like domain-driven design and command query responsibility segregation. You, you're not going to learn this in 40 minutes. It's impossible. But if you have a lot of questions and you start researching yourself, then uh, a, a new world is going to open up to you and you're going to be much more capable to bring value to your business. It's not that you're going to use this all the time. In fact, it's costly. We're going to talk later about when to use domain-driven design and when to avoid it. But it, knowing why it's useful and when to use it is, is just... Uh, an, an incredible advantage to you as a developer. So, okay, let's get back to the to the argument, aggregate routes. The aggregate routes are um, uh, the aggregate. It's a concept that's uh, uh, in domain-driven design that uh, talks about consistency of invariance. An invariant is um, a condition or a rule that has to be true at all times. For example, the, 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 the product uh, category that we've just seen, when you set a discount that's above 30%, it has to be a super discount. So that, that's an invariant. You cannot have a, 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 a discount more than 30% and the status set to a, 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 a not something else than a super discount. So um, in aggregates ensure invariance within its boundaries. In fact, aggregates are just objects. Aggregate routes are objects that contain other objects inside them. They act as an interface to the outside world. And when you perform an operation, you do it through the aggregate route, which is the, the object that contains all the other objects. And this aggregate route ins ensures the, the invariance, that invariants are maintained inside the boundaries. Uh, Translating it to the old approach, they're just entities that you uh, work with and then you save them. But you should just uh, call a single one of them uh, for every request. Like in this case, order could be an aggregate route that contains line items uh, that are other entities, but they're inside the aggregate route, so it's okay. You call a, a purchase method inside the order aggregate route, and then you're done with your transaction. Uh, this purchase method will ensure that all the uh, invariants inside the aggregate route are maintained and you won't have to deal with concurrency because of this rule of calling, uh, calling a single um, method uh, per aggregate route per request. Now, we're going to see more about this later. Um, okay, now, uh, what our architecture looks like now is not a la the classic layer architecture. If you remember, the classic layer architecture is just presentation layer, domain layer, and persistence layer. 
It's similar, but it's a little bit more sophisticated. In fact, it's the other part of it is the interface layer. It's the interface layer and the infrastructure layer. The infrastructure layer knows about the application, the interface, the controllers, you could say, and the application knows about the domain. In fact, the domain model resides in that in the center. It knows nothing about anyone else. It just knows about business rules, and that's it. The application knows about the domain and orchestrates operations using the domain model to uh, perform user requests. And the infrastructure deals with database and file systems and controllers, REST and everything else. So, um, okay, let's, um, let's talk now about, um, let's expand our domain a little bit. Uh, our domain, um, contains also an inventory and then uh, a catalog. An inventory is, um, is what we have on stock, right? And, and our, who, our suppliers and how much we pay to our suppliers and things like that. Our catalog is what we have for sale. We care about the price that we're selling the item for. Uh, we don't care about the suppliers and things like that, right? But uh, but they, they all talk about the same thing, about the same product. So we have the product that has name, that has price from the supplier, a supplier, and then it has even a shipping status when you send the, the product to the user. But this uh, is starting to smell a little bit because there are many, many concepts. They, we're, we're, we all they all talk about a product. They all regard the same item, but there are concepts that are not, uh, that don't have the same responsibilities and don't have the same goals. In fact, what we're doing here is we're mixing concerns, but, but concerns from different contexts, from different points of view of the same thing, of the same pro product. So from the, and this is the concept called bounded context in domain-driven design. From the point of view of our e-commerce side, product is nothing more than what the user see, the price we sell it for, how many items we have for sale, discounts and things like that. From our inventory point of view, we have suppliers, we have uh, uh, how long we have to wait to, for those products to get to, to our storage, things like that. And we have shipping, that means uh, keep tracking of how uh, the, the shipping status when we send a product to a user, for example. And those three contexts have different points of view of the same product. And uh, bounded contexts are about identifying those, those points of view, those different contexts in your domain, and separating them. Because if you mix them, it's just as bad as mixing presentation code with the database code. We all know about that. In fact, we're very good at separating concerns at a technical level. We, we don't let database queries in, in controllers and things like that. Um, so uh, we should separate that conceptually as well. And we, we have this, for example, a product, we, we, could, ha we could do something like that. A product in the e-commerce uh, context and a product in the inventory context, they both have uh, only the properties they care about. And in the shipping context, in fact, the, the concept changed. It's not a, a product anymore, it's an item. So it's an item that we ship. We can ship a, a membership card, for example, not just a product. So we were mixing concepts in the same, um, in the same object, which would lead to terrible bugs. This was a simple example, but I've seen huge objects because of this. So bounded contents communicate between them in many ways. You can have them in a single machine, so they would communicate between threads, or you could have them in different machines, so you, they communicate with events and event bus or ESB, many, many different ways. The important thing is to separate them and do not let data or concepts from one bounded context to lead to another bounded context to keep your domains clean. Now, uh, how to identify those bounded contexts? We usually use something called the ubiquitous language, which is the language used by our domain experts. If, if one person from the shipping department talks about shipping status and companies that ship products and things like that, you should pay attention to that. They're not gonna talk about discounts, for example. They're not gonna talk about uh, promotions or things like that. And in, instead, a user from the e-commerce site 
it's gonna care only about those things. So that's how you identify those contexts, those different points of view. Also, you can think about goals and the organizational structure. Usually, organizational structure are it's a very, for example, marketing and uh, operations things like that. They're different units, and they they have different bounded contexts. Okay, so. Um, just what is DDD then? In fact, I didn't start with a definition of domain-driven design. I just started with mixing concepts, the, the getters and setters, and um, but I did it on purpose because DDD is not easy to define, especially for people who haven't seen them before. Um, DDD is just an approach to developing software that uh, is sent, uh, it places the domain at its center of attention. I mean, we shouldn't talk about databases or um, data models like in, in entity relationship uh, models. We should talk about business concepts, business goals, and those things should drive our, our changes to our system. Um, we should focus on what matters, in fact, because our, our business doesn't care which database we use, we, which uh, technologies we use. It only cares about adding value to their business process. And to do so, domain-driven design has two parts. One's a strategic design, which is identifying the context, how the various contexts relate to each other, and then strategic design, which is a little bit more detailed implementation of a single context, which are the entities and the value objects that we just talked about, and the aggregate roots. So these two parts are very different. In fact, you can use only strategic design to see your different contexts and know where to focus your efforts. Or you can see you can use only some patterns of the tactical design, although I don't recommend that. In fact, the, the most valuable piece of, of uh, uh, information that the mainstream design gives you is uh, tactical design. Oh, sorry, strategic design. Now um, we're going to talk about uh, user interfaces real fast because we've just dealt with the operations up until now. So what if the user wants to see a product? We just a product that uh, a list of products that that or a product that he has just uh, uh, purchased. You have a controller like this that returns the product object, but that is a domain object. So you're coupling your uh, your domain layer with your presentation layer. You could do so if you you know what you're doing, but in complex projects, this tends to get uh, get a little bit nasty, as we're going to see later. So this is the user dashboard. It contains a list of projects, and uh, but it has a shipping status. And remember that we've, we've separated the, the item that uh, deals with shipping status into another object, right? So that's, that's to show you that interfaces do not map with uh, domain objects. They pick information from various sources, and they build an interface with the information the user cares about. Um, so to build this, we, we have to write a DTO in that case, and we can do two things. We can query the, query the database and do a join, and then map that to our DTO, or we can just, uh, or we can just um, use an ORM and get the, the objects that, we, that contain the data we care about and, and map them to a DTO. Um, but that, that, that tells you something. That tells you that that DTO doesn't match with your domain object, that means it's another model. You're generating that model at runtime, but it's still another model. Now, we're going to see that in a very significant way now with this example, a list of products by category. If you click in a category, it should list all the, <coughs> in a category, sorry, it should list all the products in, in the same category. Uh, it's just a filter. It's very easy, right? So I'm, I'm not even going to show an example of this. You, you can have a product with a category, and then you can do a select by where category D, and that's it. And you have the list of your products in a category. But what if we um, we want to add uh, subcategories? Uh, you, you have a category three that has um, like books uh, uh, of type technical, and if you click on technical books, you should see only technical books. But that's not a problem, as we can just uh, modify our category object. We add a name and we add a parent, so they, we have a tree. And we can show that tree without any problem. If we, you click in, a, in the plus sign, we would just do a, a, an Ajax call and select the, the categories that are children of that category. 
the product has a category, so we can uh, search them by category as well without any problem. However, what if the, the business owner makes a, a simple request change? That if you click in the big category, he wants to see all the products in that category. If, if it's, for example, if you click in books, you, you need to see all the books. If you click in technical, you only see the technical books. That, from a business perspective, is, is simple. It's a pretty simple change. But what, what can we do to do that? Um, this is just to get uh, the category three, uh, all the categories in a, in a single, uh, uh, in a single, uh, you, you select one category and you, you want to get all the three from that, uh, starting from that category. Since you're, you, we're using a relational database, we're simulating uh, a, a tree, and you have to do a, a, a nasty query like this to get uh, uh, all the categories, uh, starting with one as the root. You could also change your domain model. You have a category that has children, and that has children that are products as well, and that's going to be very painful as well, because Hibernate, uh, you're going to have to deal with that a little bit <laughs> more. Um, it's not going to be that easy to map them. The other solution would be to be in the middle. Like, you have a category, uh, and for every category, you have a, a, a parent ID <laughs> for every uh, for every level that you support. In fact, if you say our, our tree is going to have at most five levels, so you will have five parent IDs, right? So you can do a query that's not like this, but it's going to be a little bit more um, performant. But it's, you're still doing something that's not, uh, I wouldn't define clean, for example. So what's the conclusion of that? Is that, um, um, if I'm going to skip this, because is that, uh, Writes and reads are different things. We're using different models. The fact that we want to see the categories as a tree doesn't have anything to do with purchasing something or as associating a product with a category. There are two different things. In fact, if we separate this um, at an architectural level, we separate commands from queries following the CQS principle, uh, we would end up with something like that, something that gives us uh, uh, two interfaces, two facades, and uh, let's get back to that because we don't have time. Um, so uh, the two facades would work like this. You do something in the write model, then you dispatch an event just like we've seen before, and you would update the read model uh, like this. If you uh, add a product to, to a category, you would have a handler that contains the event product added and then inserts that in a separate table in another model. We don't use the same table that we use to, to recreate our domain objects. We use another table, another model. So you dispatch an event that a, a, a product has been added, you insert that into the table, and then that's it. The, the, if, if, if the product has been shipped, there's another handler for that event, and you update the same table that contains the, the, the user uh, dashboards. Then later, you just query that table. In fact, you, you, you serialize this thing. You, this table becomes a table in your database in, uh, for the read side. Uh, so if we had to do that for the tree example, we could choose for the read model the right data structure, which is a graph like this, right? You have a graph that would navigate to the categories and all the children and all the products. And to do that, uh, it would be pretty simple. I'm, I'm using a simple API called Blueprints, but you don't have to understand it. The, the concept is that when a category has been added, I just modify my graph. And then when I want to read the, the, all the products inside a category, I just navigate the graph. And that's it. But I don't use a graph for my domain model. My domain model contains my domain objects with domain operations. My read model contains a graph. And with that graph, it, this thing is not only faster, but it's, it's simple. In fact, it's just this. Compare to that with the union or with the nasty object uh, mapping that we had to do to modify our domain, or with the parent IDs that we had to add. In fact, 
the solution is uh, is pretty simple compared to that. And if you consider an example, for example, adding more categories to a single pro. Uh, the single product that would be a dead sentence in the in the previous architecture. With the new architecture, command, uh, query responsibility segregation, all you have to do is you just modify your your your, your domain object to contain multiple categories. The the event will contain multiple categories as well, and then that's it. You uh, the, the the event handler would be the same because graphs by nature support multiple relationships. So. Uh, if you see a pattern, you would see that um, read models are all about data. In fact, when we read a screen, or in, in that case, when we read a graph, all we care about is the data. We don't care about business operations. In fact, why should we load an object that has behavior just to show it on the screen? That's just data for the screen. And our write model cares about domains, domain rules. It cares about domain operations. So. Our write model is domain oriented, and our read model is, is data oriented. Separating those two things is fundamental. Uh, I'm going to skip this, and uh, this is an overview of command query responsibility segregation. You send a command. The command does an operation in the domain model. The domain model dispatches an event. The event updates the read model. And then when you want to query, you just query the read model, which is usually a table or a document or a graph, that, and the queries are going to be simple. In fact, joints are rare in these cases. Uh, so uh, uh, to recap, uh, CQS is a, is a principle that we can use at an architectural model, or architectural level, sorry. The read and write model are two separate concerns. It's, it's like the bounded context we just saw. We just saw that inventory is different from uh, the e-commerce, and also the query model is different from the write model because uh, what we see on the screen is, is not relevant to the operations we perform on, on our domain. And you cannot solve all the problems with a single model. Uh, you need to have multiple models to solve many problems efficiently. Um, so um, with that, uh, I'm sure that at least 50% uh, wasn't that clear, but that <laughs> that's, um, I hope the, the, the errors were clear, I mean the problems. It's not easy to solve, to use a single model to solve all the concerns of your domain, read and write concerns, to do everything with a normalized model. In fact, uh, what I've seen lately is that people uh, tend to not, uh, tend to fear denormalization. When denormalization simplifies things a, a, a lot in some in some cases, like we've just seen, the fact that we had a graph for read and a normal object for writes uh, simplified the probably saved a lot of time and money uh, in in that that example. Now, uh, yep. Sì, uh, um, però esatto, puoi usare un database normale, cioè l'esempio, eh, il concetto era la, cioè, non, non ti dico usare il database a grafo, che, che quella non è la soluzione, cioè, infatti devi usare il database che ti serve, cioè se per, per quel modello il grafo il, 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 il data model migliore è meglio usare il grafo, se poi metti anche in considerazione il fatto che devi avere le conoscenze sul database di grafi e ti costa di meno fare una cosa che non è ottima ma comunque con cose che già sai, allora scegli la soluzione migliore. Infatti eh, il, il succo del talk è che i modelli sono diversi, i, eh, i, gli obiettivi dei modelli sono diversi e, e non puoi nascondere questo. Poi come risolvi il problema devi anche considerare il contesto. Infatti, se non, non hai programmatori bravi da capire questi concetti, ehm, mo, forse non ti conviene. Cioè, è, è un investimento pesante, però che ti dà una, una semplicità, come in quel caso che abbiamo visto, allucinante. In casi più complessi è proprio, non c'è paragone. Però ehm, tieni sempre in conto il, il contesto. Che è, e non ti dimenticare che sono due modelli diversi, anche se, eh, anche se poi decidi di non, non renderlo esplicito, però se lo genera a runtime è comunque, è comunque esiste, solo che a runtime non è, non è persistito. Poi comunque i graph non sono così comuni, di solito sono i document database, un relazionale va bene lo stesso là.
Eh, perfetto. Infatti quella è una domanda molto comune. Eh, eh, la, la parte dei command, la parte dei command è, è, è dove usi, infatti la prima parte di domain driven design è strategic design, no? quindi identifichi tutti i contesti ad alto livello. E, e la CQRS non c'entra più di tanto, quindi è una cosa più di, di business. Poi una volta che identifichi i vari contesti, separi ulteriormente... Le, i comandi dalle query in altri due bounded context diversi però il bounded context de, di scrittura quello dei command contiene il domain model e là puoi usare tactical design cioè gli aggregate root, le entity e tutto il resto l'altro bounded context invece non è domain driven, è data driven perché a, a, a noi interessa infatti se, se torniamo velocemente a uno degli esempi ehm, ci interessa soltanto i dati per farli vedere No? qui faccio una query e poi la restituisco qui ne negli event handler aggiorno le tabelle o aggiorno il grafo e poi ti restituisco i dati quindi domain driven design eh, tactical design qui non ha senso le entity e tutto il resto nella parte dei comandi sì perché eh, lavoro con eh, l'hai il comportamento esatto infatti nell'altro bounded context di read non ha senso tirarti fuori tutti gli aggregate con tutto il comportamento solo per far vedere le maschere per quello li separi però il tactical design lo uso solo, solo nella parte write Altre domande? Sì, sì, ci sono, no, infatti sì, 5 righe perché il, il tocca è 40 minuti, però eh, ci, sono, eh, ci sono i libri più che altro, quello il Blue Book di... No, no, lo so, c'è il libro, il libro di Blue Book e poi eh, il libro, il Red Book che implementa in Domain Driven Design di Yvonne Vernon che contiene il codice su GitHub, se tu vai sul, sul suo account, contiene gli esempi implementati in base al suo libro. Poi... No, in realtà, cioè, co cosa intendi per progetto vero? Ce ne stanno tanti. Progetto in produzione e open source, dici? No, beh, no, no, no. Un caso reale è open source, no? Perché caso reale ce ne stanno tantissimi. Ehm, sì, no, ci sono... C'è un'azienda che si chiama Locad, che è fatta da... Eh, da Rinata Abdulin che è uno che, che segue queste cose e ha fatto un esempio molto estensivo su queste cose cioè eh, si basa su delle cose che lui ha fatto in produzione chiaramente nessuno ti mette quello che ha fatto in produzione open source però è l'esempio più estensivo che, che, che riesco a trovare poi c'è il libro di sì poi eh, comunque non è che, ehm, che ti servono gli esempi fino al, al, al minimi dettagli, è importante capire i concetti, poi gli esempi servono sicuro perché è difficile, però con quegli esempi di Loca, di DD, riesci ad andare avanti molto bene, secondo me. Sì, sì. C'è un esempio, però utilizza il framework Axon. Anche. C'è un esempio, con i soggetti è abbastanza strutturato. Se poi li tiri fuori il framework hai capito quello che serve. Axon framework. È un framework in Java. Sì. Eh, infatti questa è un'altra ottima domanda perché eh, se il tuo dominio è complesso eh, la soluzione migliore è questa o almeno una cosa simile eh, però devi tenere in, in considerazione anche il contesto cioè se hai tempi minimi o non hai programmatori bravi o non hai la collaborazione di esperti di dominio eh, spenderai più tempo e più soldi eh. per progetti complessi non lo batti no niente